Hello and welcome. My name is Andrew Devereaux of the Department of History at the University of California, San Diego. And as one of the co-hosts, along with Professor Barbara Fuchs of the Early Modern Cosmopolitanism Speaker Series, I would like to welcome you all to our third talk in this year's lineup. The Speaker Series is supported by UCLA's Center for 17th and 18th Century Studies. And I would like to thank the director of the center, Professor Bronwyn Wilson, as well as the center's staff, particularly Jeanette Levere and Eric Bowman for their help in making these events possible. In the age of Zoom, a very special thanks is due to Alistair Thorne, whose technical assistance on all things audiovisual is invaluable. Following today's talk, there will be time for questions and discussion, so I invite everyone to stick around for that. We will be using the Q&A function to ask questions. You can find the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to the right of the record feature. Just click on the Q&A icon and type in your question, and then either Barbara or I will read it out to our guest and to the audience. Today, our guest is Zoltan Biederman, Professor of Early Modern History at University College London. He has previously taught at Birkbeck College, the École des Hautes Études et Sciences Sociales in Paris, Brown University, and the Universidade Nova de Lisboa. Biederman's presence with us today represents a homecoming of sorts as he was an Amundsen Getty postdoctoral fellow at UCLA in 2006, 2007. Biederman is an historian of the Portuguese empire in Asia with a focus on early modern diplomacy, imperial literature, material culture, cartography, and the politics of space. He is the author of several books, including Disconnected Empires, Imperial Portugal, Sri Lankan Diplomacy and the Making of a Habsburg Conquest in Asia, published by Oxford University Press in 2018. He has also recently co-edited Global Gifts, The Material Culture of Diplomacy in Early Modern Eurasia, Sri Lanka at the Crossroads of History, and From the Supernatural to the Uncanny. Biederman is currently preparing a book on early modern travel literature and cartography and working towards a larger book project to trace the conceptual origins of early modern globalization. Beyond his core research, he teaches topics in comparative literature and has been involved in the making of the short films Flying and Spying, A Renaissance Dream Comes True, and Austerlitz London. Both are available online. Biederman's talk today is titled A Catholic Cosmopolis, Interpreting Diversity in a Coercive Empire. And I should note that we will be recording today's talk and the recording will be posted to the center's YouTube channel. So without further ado, please welcome Professor Zoltan Biederman. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andrew, for the kind words. And above all, Andrew, Barbara, and all the others for the, this wonderful invitation, which honors me. Thanks, thank you also to all those who are in the room who I cannot see. It is really much appreciated. In the introduction to his widely acclaimed treatise, Cosmopolitanism, Ethics in a World of Strangers, Kwame Anthony Apai reminisces of Kumasi, the capital of Ghana's Asante region. In 1950s, Kumasi Apaya tells us, you could wander down the main thoroughfare toward the railway station and pass the bazaar of Mr. Babu, a charming and courteous and quoting Indian, who also happened to be a Rotarian, the rice shop of the Irani brothers, numerous other shops run by Lebanese and Syrian families, Muslims and Maronites, and even a business owned by Druze. Ethnically foreign soldiers from the North populated the barracks, and occasional Europeans haunting the town included, I quote, the Greek architect, the Hungarian artist, that would be me, the Irish doctor, the Scots engineer, along with some English barristers and judges, and a wild international assortment of professors, end of quote, at the university. Quite wonderful, but might we also want to point out that this went on under the umbrella of empire. Why do people live or come to live to places where, while retaining some parts of their identity, they and their descendants may have to shed some others. Naturally, many people become citizens of empire by simply staying put when one regime replaces another. Many do mount a resistance to acculturation, be that by refusing to learn the new language of state or by continuing to worship the old gods. 
Others may witness the moment of imperial usurpation and protest by leaving. There are also those who are made to leave, of course, or threatened with expulsion if they fail to adapt. And those who are brought to an expanding realm by sheer force, many of them. But again, some adopt the new mores with remarkable verve, sometimes zeal, and some do even join empires voluntarily from the outside or attach themselves to them by adopting certain elements of their culture, a language, a literary or artistic style, a type of artifact, a certain kind of food or dress, and so on. Why? Over the next 50 or so minutes, I wish to sketch a basic roadmap that may or may not help us answer the question for the global Iberian case. I will do this by drawing on the notion of the cosmopolitan in adjectivized association with places and with lives, following here some very broad definitions taken from the Oxford English Dictionary just to get us going. I will then discuss the question contained in the title of today's talk, not so much to give an unambiguous answer, but to explore the hermeneutical potential of the notion of cosmopolis and propose a strategy for the comparative and connective study of processes of political and cultural attraction to the Spanish and Portuguese empires. I am extremely grateful, but also humbled by this invitation. I have struggled over the past months to frame my questions and in the process of reading up on so many aspects of American history that historians like myself working primarily in Asia rarely engage with, I often lost my orientation. This is partly down to my own limitations, made worse by the impossibility of conducting fresh archival work or even going to a good library over the past year. But there's also a wider problem in how far behind we all are, I think, when it comes to studying the Western and the Eastern halves of European expansion in uh, inverted commas together. I count on the audience's empathy as I delve into my paper after a long day of work in London. It's going to get dark here soon. My institution is missing that capital A that would make it and my life perfect. I will be most grateful for any questions, suggestions that will further sharpen my understanding of things unfamiliar to me or worse, things familiar that I may still be getting wrong. In 1596, Itinerario, the account of the young Dutchman Jan Heuchen van Linschoten's time spent in the Portuguese empire in Asia, offered a description of how in Goa, the Portuguese, I quote, dwell in the town among all sorts of nations, as Indians, heathens, Moors, Jews, Armenians, Gujaratis, Binyans, Brahmins, and of all Indian nations and people which do all dwell and traffic therein, every man holding his own religion without constraining any man to do against his conscience. A few years later in 1604, Bernardo de Balbuena sang the praise of the city of Mexico with its quote, men and women of diverse colors and professions, various states and appearances different in language, in nation, in motivation, aim and opinion, end of quote. The theme of the big city congregating a variety of peoples and standing at the center of a trans transcontinental network covering all four parts of the new known world was popular in the Catholic monarchy. Mexico, Balbuena continued, I quote, traded with Asia, Ethiopia, Alemania, Barbary, and also Britain, Greece, Flanders, and Turkey, making sure that it received the best of all these worlds. No better way to introduce the complicated realities of life in a well-connected early modern city of empire because of course, we all know the catch. Balbuena could not proceed in his encomium without adding that Mexico was also, quote, a well-armed fortress of the faith, the terror of heretics, an unassailable wall guarded by God, a spy to whom nothing will remain secret, a place where the holy tribunal makes sure to guard the untainted quality of its clean and noble inhabitants. And indeed, Linshoten himself explained how Hindus were only allowed their ceremonies outside of the island of Goa in the inland villages. As for those converted, he added, he that is once christened and is after found to use any heathenish superstitions is subject to the Inquisition. <laughs> 
end of quote. I was quoting for the, from the 1598 um, English, the first English translation here. Now there's a tension, perhaps indeed a fully fledged contradiction between the two sides or two aspects of life in the Catholic monarchy. The one that offered a home to so many peoples and the one that coerced them more or less violently, violently, more or less insidiously or explicitly into sharing a single religion, conducting administrative and legal business in a single or two languages and recognizing a single Iberian monarch as the supreme head of the polity. This tension is reflected in the way we write the histories of the early modern empires and the united monarchy of Portugal and Spain. When the cosmopolitan appears, it does, it often does so, but it devoid of theorization, as if it was self-evidently a quality of globally connected multi-ethnic realms, towns, and peoples. Think of Jose Carlos de la Puente's by all means excellent, as far as I can tell, book Andean Cosmopolitans, or Seville, the cosmopolitan court, making an, a brief appearance in Nancy van Doysen's equally outstanding Global Indios, or the Lisbon explored as a global city in the rather wonderful English and Portuguese versions, there are two different ones, of a game-changing volume edited by Anne-Marie Jordan, Gschwend, and Kate Lowe. On the other hand, when one suggests to theorize the cosmopolitan for Renaissance, especially late Renaissance Portugal and Spain, smiles tend to freeze and eyebrows go up. I should like to clarify then that there is obviously no point in taking a lofty, idealized, largely normative notion of cosmopolitanism. For example, quote, the belief that all people are entitled to equal respect and consideration, no matter what their citizens, the citizenship status or other affiliations happen to be, end of quote. Take this and throw it into the arena with societies that produce the whole bureaucracy designed to neutralize deviance and preclude dissent. Uh, the results are to be expected. But then, then again, take such a lofty idealized notion of cosmopolitanism and throw it into the ring with more or less any imperial formation of the past or the present, not much good is going to happen. In sum, I will obviously not be whitewashing the monarchy to argue that it was cosmopolitan. I rather think we can bring the cosmopolitan down into the earthly existences of the people we study and see then how it may, or perhaps may not, this is an experiment, help us better to understand certain aspects of the monarchy. To work along the rough edges of life in our empires, we need sturdy tools. The cosmopolitan tends to be a fragile one, but we can toughen it. Allow me then to draw just very briefly on a study here in comparative urban history that I began actually quite some years ago, partly here, there in LA, but which few in the room I think will be familiar with. I hope you accept um, my apologies for bringing older materials here. This study, a corrected and expanded version of which printed in 2014 is available on academia.edu, juxtaposes two South Asian port, port cities as they developed under Portuguese and later Dutch rule. Kananur and Colombo in modern Kerala and Sri Lanka were both Muslim dominated oceanic ports serving nearby political centers ruled by a Hindu and a Buddhist king respectively, when the Portuguese first appeared in the adjacent waters around 1500. For reasons I have no time here to discuss, the two evolved very differently under the Portuguese. On the one hand, Cananor became a composite urban center consisting of a fortified core area, A, inhabited by Portuguese officials, soldiers, and uh, traders married, so-called casados, uh, men and their families. Then a semi-fortified area B, inhabited by Indian Christians and their families, a buffer zone C, inhabited by local fishing folk, and finally D, something that is not often represented, the original town of Kanur, here designated as Bazar de Cananor, uh, sometimes appearing as Bazar dos Mouros, a bustling commercial center it's dominated by Malabari Muslim Mapila traders, independent from Portuguese authority. In many ways, the center of the conurbation was really this latter area here in color. It existed in its location before the Portuguese arrived. It housed a prosperous community existing in a symbiotic relationship with the inland Hindu Raja and his court. And its Muslim leadership even developed their own military and political ambitions. The point to take away in the context of the present paper 
is that Kanano was home to at least four quite different communities, different in terms of religion, language, economic focus, and or political allegiance. It was in this sense a model cosmopolitan port in the Indian Ocean context, yet it maintained this diversity with the help of a structural expedient we tend to consider antithetical to cosmopolitanism, walls. A few hundred kilometers further south, Colombo developed differently. Here too, the first Portuguese attempt at settling involved building a fort, A, on an isolated peninsula at a safe distance from the existing port, C, but as the structure was abandoned by the authorities after just six years of occupation in 1524, the Portuguese traders began to settle informally and chose to do so in an area here marked B, roughly, closer to the existing town, C. When a garrison was established again in 1551, the authorities attempted to fortify just one part of the conurbation again, just close to the sea. But the local population by now would have none of it. A larger perimeter, about six kilometers long, here marked as D, was fortified instead to include the various neighborhoods. In 1565, the court of the Singhalese king moved from Cote, just 10 kilometers inland to Colombo, where it enjoyed Portuguese military protection. A whole royal court came to settle in a city that also housed a large Portuguese garrison. The population grew in confidence and prosperity as hundreds of Portuguese men married into Sinhalese families, an Iberian style municipal council developed, headed by men from this new local elite. The Sinhalese monarch died in 1597, replaced by the absent Habsburg monarch, rather than a local vassal king. As the territorial conquest of the island began, the pressure grew on the remaining Buddhist families to convert to Catholicism or be very discreet about their faith. The truth is we don't really know much about the process, but the process of elite replacement began. And although it is not quite clear to what extent the remaining non-Christian families converted, lost influence and or moved away. Colombo became a reasonably important city of empire dominated by a citizenry in large measure descended from the pre-conquest alliances of Portuguese and Sinhalese families. But now speaking Portuguese, living in houses built in the Indo-Portuguese fashion and worshiping in Baroque churches. No ethnically differentiated neighborhoods can be distinguished from the record by the time the town fell to the Dutch in 1656. Colombo functioned as a melting pot, integrating its inhabitants into a single socially highly stratified but ethnically and religiously increasingly homogenous body. Integration and participation in the empire came at a high cost in terms of reduced religious diversity, but there were no walls. I feel in no position to declare which of the two urban types, Kananor, the multi-sector conurbation, or Colombo, the melting pot, was the more cosmopolitan. Each city supported border crossings and complex repertoires of allegiance, identity, and interest in its own flawed ways. Very little has been written to compare and connect cities in this perspective, especially across the two empires. Take Lima as a possible term of comparison. I don't know much about it. A city established to house a community of Españoles separately from the Indios of the surrounding valleys, and of course, at a clear distance from the old seat of power, rather faith facing the sea, connecting it with Spain. Despite being an exclusionary space in its fundamental legal setup, Lima inevitably attracted substantial population flows from its hinterland. Thousands of Indios either settled in nearby Indio municipalities or settled on the immediate outskirts of um, the city's initially unfortified perimeter or indeed infiltrated it. When the latter was the case, these migrants needed to dissimulate their ethnic identity. They would dress, speak and behave in such a way that they could be accepted or at least tolerated within Spanish Lima as new pieces in the urban mechanism, everything that makes an herbs function, and in the longer run become full members of the urban community, the civitas as Richard Kagan would have it. In other words, a city built to keep people apart, both succumbed to undesirable, undesired people coming in and succeeded at digesting them. After a while of this, Lima, as I understand it from the little I know about it, was not a Spanish city anymore in the original sense, but nor were its inhabitants 
its inhabitants not Spanish. So what do we do with this? There is to be sure an option simply to conclude that neither Colombo, nor Cananor, nor Lima, nor Cartagena, nor any of these places were truly and fully cosmopolitan because they were all far too deeply entangled with the realities of Iberian imperialism and universalism and its deep-seated anxieties about cultural, especially religious, difference. Such gesturing tends to come accompanied by the notion that another better world existed out there beyond the world created by the Spanish and the Portuguese, a notion I am somewhat skeptical of, partly because of the way it reifies European versus other ways of managing difference, although I cannot fully dismiss it. A much more interesting prospect, especially if we seek, as I hope more of us will in the future, to work towards a critical comparative and connective history of Spanish and Portuguese and Dutch and French and English empire building, is this, embrace the conundrum, place it at the heart of the argumentative dialogical engagement that we are expected to have with the past. We do not have to decide today which city, which polity, which empire was the most cosmopolitan. We can discuss the question, we can see the connections and disconnections unfold, how they are shaped by different urban spaces, how they shape different urban spaces, embrace the fact that it is going to be work in progress for quite a long time. The attraction in particular that empires exerted on so many of those that they then came to coerce is both an unsettling and timely topic to tackle. Today, as in the past, people do move towards centers of power, economic, cultural, political, that then put pressure on them to adapt, to acculturate. If complexity, ambiguity, and simultaneity of contradictory dynamics is what the archive throws at us, then evading these should obviously not be our tactic. In fact, we are at a good junction to engage with contradictions today. The field we work in has gone through a salutary cycle undermining the old paradigm of early onset Iberian absolutism, as I think every single one of the recently published overview works uh, on these two empires, except there's been an exceptional, extraordinary flurry of overview works in the last three years. Um, the state, and I'm just putting this up here, but I'm going to take it away so people don't get distracted. Um, it's going to be on the recording, of course. The state has been de- and reconstructed. The prospect of provincializing Iberia and Europe is in breach. We have outstanding studies now of centrifugal forces at work in the Portuguese empire in Asia. Similar centrifugal movements are evident for West Africa. The slightly more recent compellingly productive surge regarding police centricity, especially in the United Catholic monarchy, is equally great. The polycentric paradigm in particular, whilst positing multiple centers, uh, is in part at least to enact its own centrifugal movement away from that older centralist paradigm. All of this has been valuable and important and we need to continue doing it. All I would like to suggest is that we also revisit the centripetal forces, and I'm very aware that this metaphor is far from perfect. I suggest that we attempt doing this without falling back into the Eurocentric scheme where the centripetal is somehow inherently the domain of Iberian forces sitting at the center, while the centrifugal is somehow consequently the domain of others reacting to those forces of the center. This is why I think the study of centripetal forces grounded in indigenous agency in so-called peripheral areas matters. An example of a life spent seeking to emulate the culture of the center is that of a Sinhalese prince known to us only by his Christian name, Don Juan de Candia, John of Candy, born sometime before 1591 as a rightful heir to the throne of Candia, Candy, Kanda Udaraspada in the central highlands of Sri Lanka. Don Juan and his entourage came under pressure after the Iberian authorities moved to a policy of conquest in this island in the mid 1590s, as I mentioned earlier. Where formerly, formerly, Sinhalese princes had been courted as potential vassal kings who might pay allegiance and tribute to the Portuguese crown, the picture suddenly changed. Royal figures like Don Juan became a matter of concern. Now, interestingly, rather than fleeing, Don Juan went to Goa. Uh, 
Here, he received a Catholic education at the Franciscan Collegio dos Reis Magos. In 1608, he was granted permission to leave India for Lisbon, and there he arrived around 16, in 1610. In Portugal, where he arrived, he, it was attempted to lock him away with his fellow traveler, another prince known to us only as Don Felipe, in a convent in Coimbra. Don Juan re refused. He demanded to stay in Lisbon and be treated in accordance with his royal status. His claims to the throne of Candy were taken seriously by the authorities, both in Lisbon and in Madrid, where he traveled once or possibly twice. The first trip to Spain would have occurred in 1611, the first royal decree in Don Juan's favor having been passed on November the 26th that year. Don Juan renounced his rights to the throne of Candy in Madrid and apparently took Franciscan vows, vows in return for an allowance of 4,000 cruzados a year raised in 1626, possibly the time of a second visit to Spain to 8,000 cruzados, along with the honor of being treated as a grandee and various other privileges. He amassed a large portfolios, portfolio of properties in Portugal, including an urban palace in Lisbon, the inventory of which suggests a, a conscious effort at surrounding himself with the material culture and even the soundscape characteristic of aristocratic dwellings in the capital. He kept a number of servants and slaves from Africa and the New World and an entourage of other Lankans. Despite his vote of chastity, and much to the chagrin of the authorities, he fathered two daughters, one of whom somehow um, was, was legitimate. Most impressively, perhaps, Don Juan came to rest after his death in 1642 in a Franciscan convent he himself had founded, built, and provided with funds in perpetuity at Telleiras in the northern uh, outskirts of Lisbon in 1625. The church still exists, although much of the current building results from reconstruction following the earthquake. 1755. How do we read such a life? Do we read it as a cosmopolitan career congregating a rich variety of cultural experiences and a tense but productive multiplicity of political allegiances? Or as an example of a reductive descent into exile, acculturation, alienation, and loss of identity? Surely there is a case to argue that it was some of both. In this complexity, Don Juan's life will be reminiscent to many in this room today, I expect, of the lives of Inca Garcilaso, Guaman Poma, Juan Latino, and so many others, with the added interest that Don Juan uh, was an individual born outside of the realm who came into it. His coat of arms also survives in the Archaeological Museum of Carmo in, in Lisbon. Um, and I would say his coat of arm really exudes confidence and the sense that royal blood would translate into high respectability in the monarchy, allowing status to trump ethnicity. Bordered with the seven castles of the Portuguese crown's coat of arms, it boasts a Singhalese lion rampant, a somewhat strangely shaped tower crowned with the cross of Avish in reference to the Portuguese dynasty to whom several Lankan rulers had pledged allegiance before 1581, and a resplendent sun in reference to Don Juan's belonging to the solar dynasty of Lanka in inverted comma, the Surya Vansa. The open crown signaled the prince's grandee status. The very dedication of the Telleiras church to St. John Baptist and Our Lady of the Door of Heaven, Nossa Senhora da Porta do Céu, is indicative of a complex and quite erudite intellectual world. I wish I had more time here to elaborate. You can find the rest of the story in a chapter on exiles in the book mentioned already, Sri Lanka at the Crossroads of History, which is freely accessible online. The whole book. All this happened against the background of widespread violence. The Roman Missal from which the prince took the clue about the open door of heaven was an instrument of control and coercion, of course. We know about some of these converted individuals thinking because one black preacher called Manuel was denounced to the Lisbon Inquisition a few years after Don Juan's death. He was accused of holding mass in a state of inebriation and proclaiming to the old Christian congregation that the Eucharist was of little value compared to the grace flowing through conversion. The case was dropped for reasons I'm still to understand, but it could have ended very badly for him, of course. The woman Don Juan married at one point, Susana de Abreu, may herself have been a new Christian. We don't know. 
During those same years, Portuguese troops engaged in campaign after campaign to reduce the complex political landscape of Lanka to a state where it could be fully and flatly incorporated into the monarchy, its royal figures neutralized, its capital cities incinerated, its rebellious populations tortured, raped, mutilated, and massacred by the thousands. There are many reasons not to consider Don Juan's life to have been an example of cosmopolitan outreach in the loftier sense of the term. But again, life in an empire is complicated and the history we write of about, about such lives will be complicated too. Mimesis is both subject, subjection and the model of, sorry, Mimesis is both subjection to the model and defiance. There has indeed been progress in the study of the contradictory or complementary forces at play, but to integrate the literary and the historical study of imperial mimesis, as Barbara Fuchs has suggested, to integrate the study of representational and political mechanisms of mimesis into an advanced kind of cultural history, we must go further, I think. I now reckon that I need to look again at Don Juan, often referred to as the Black Prince in connection with, for example, the character of Juan de Alba in Andres de Claramonte's play El Valiente Negro in Flandes, a black protagonist and a hero, but who aspires to be a model of whiteness. Or the life and career of Juan de Pareja, Velázquez's slave and assistant, a later a free man painting in his own name, recently explored by Carmen Fracchia in her book, Black but Human. <clears throat> I also now reckon that there is an entire subfield dedicated to the study of New World heraldry, which is obviously relevant to Don Juan de Candia's case and perhaps vice versa. The Singhalese prince's coat of arms, probably sanctioned by the crown during his first visit to Madrid, suddenly echoes those of indigenous nobles in New Spain who petitioned the crown with complex heraldic designs as part of their strategies to retain some of their pre-conquest status under the new regime. The long and the short of it is that, as with cosmopolitan cities and cosmopolitan lives, such visually expressive artifacts are deeply steeped in the contradictions resulting from engaging with an expanding imperial power. <clears throat> the cosmopolitan, I think, can be productive as a concept if made to sit precisely at this uncomfortable juncture. Whilst I have so far mobilized vernacular notions of the cosmopolitan, there is a conceptually more stringent semantic sphere already at play in some of this. Cosmopolitan places, people, attitudes tend to refer to a more profound and more or less consciously cultivated sense of belonging to a world larger than the locality. In the lives of individuals like Inca Garcilaso and Don Juan de Candia, and possibly of all those who migrated to Colombo or Canon or Lima, one detects a conscious choice to belong, coming from a local context and often also going through a local context, as I, I think I understand is the message we get from the works of Tamar Herzog, to something larger. We usually call this larger entity the empire or often interchangeably the monarchy, and we occasionally also refer to it with the even more widely cast, deliberately unfocused term, terms realm, sphere, or world. For Asia, historians, Portuguese empire in Asia, of course, historians talk about firstly, the Estado da India, the official empire. Secondly, the so-called shadow empire as a secondary network of influence made of informal and semi-formal port communities, for example, around the Gulf of Bengal and the South China Seas. And thirdly, the padroado, the, uh, that, that third missionary sphere reaching far beyond the former two into territory where Portuguese authorities had no reach whatsoever. For example, the Jesuit missions in Madre or the Augustinian presence in Isfahan. Somewhat surprisingly, there is no fourth term to signify the nebula of diplomatically established relations of vassalage, friendship, and brotherhood that surrounded the Portuguese possessions, and that was in significant measure driven by others than Portuguese power figures. We know that these relations were crucial for the survival of the Estado. There has been quite a bit written about it already, but um, we don't really have a name um, to call it. Now, I, I do not know what to call this fourth sphere, and I'm not suggesting that it is the, cosmopolitan, the cosmopolis at all, but I think the term cosmopolis 
may help us think about it, both in Asia and in other parts of the world, as I will try to argue. Now, a quick check around the term cosmopolis suggests, of course, that our Iberian polities fall far short of what goes by that term in parts of Asia. Empire and cosmopolis come theorized as mutually exclusive things in the work of Sheldon Pollock, where any engagement with the concept necessarily begins. Pollock's 2006 book, The Language of the Gods in the World of Men, is largely about the use of a trans-regional language of prestige, Sanskrit, that did not pertain to any particular ethnic group, but got adopted across a geographically ample, politically diverse space, covering much of modern South Asia and Southeast Asia from about the fourth century of the Common Era. <clears throat> The crucial aspect in this is that the cosmopolis, a symbolic network, quote, expanded not by force, but by emulation. The cosmopolis had no governing center, no border or fortified for frontier. It was not a state. To adopt Sanskrit did not imply a wider transculturation, nor was this a religious umbrella, at least in Pollock's view. Pollock also makes it very clear that the Latin Empire or Latinate Empire, the closest thing that Europe produced to the Sanskrit cosmopolis was really a counter cosmopolis. The Romans expanded by waging endless wars, coerced people into using Latin, expected conquered subjects to adopt new lifestyles, used Latin to run a centralized state with heavily fortified borders and relied on Latin for its single body of law. Now, I cannot go into the details here of why we should remain somewhat critical of at least some of Pollock's reifications, nor do I have the time to explore the two other great cosmopoli of Asia theorized in recent times, Richard Eaton's Persian or Persianate cosmopolis and Ronit Ritchie's Arabic cosmopolis. The long and the short of it, again, is that in Eaton's work, in particular, the ties between cosmopolis and empire become more apparent than in Pollock, and in Ritchie's work, the matter of religious conversion is at least um, is, is acknowledged as important. This suggests that the concept of cosmopolis can be stretched and adapted to work in association with empire and with religion. To adopt it for the Iberian world will remain quite a stretch, of course, but there are aspects I feel deserve our attention, and this is, of course, the main point I wanted to get to. Um, by now, everyone is a bit tired, but I needed, and I think you will understand and, and agree that I needed this long introduction, uh, which is, of course, more than an introduction. Now, most importantly, the massive coercive powers of Spain and Portugal still tend to blind us to appropriations of Iberian cultural practices on grounds of more or less voluntary attraction. Attraction, emulation, mimicry, mimesis, both within the conquered possessions and beyond. One pattern of often overlooked has to do with Catholics who saw the monarchy as a refuge. Now, it is important, of course, to clarify, as José Javier Ruiz Ibáñez and Igor Pérez Tostado have in their groundbreaking 2015 volume, Los Exiliados del Rey de España, that a history of inward migrations can in no way make up for the terrible record of outward migrations, the human suffering caused by the monarchy's coercive institutions. There is no symmetry between the two, and I want to emphasize this aspect. And yet, there is something fruitfully unsettling about watching French and Irish Catholics seeking refuge in Spain, Greeks fleeing Ottoman rule to settle in Spanish Naples, British recusants fleeing eastward, and victims of the French wars of religion fleeing northward to the Spanish low countries of all places, Japanese Catholic Catholics taking refuge in the Philippines, and quite complicated flows of people, peoples in North America. For example, the Yamasees southward migrations into the Florida mission system in the 1660s, 70s, triggered by English related intrusions and slave raids further north. I also look forward to reading more from Cecilia Taruel, currently at Oxford, on voluntary, mi voluntary migrants to Spain coming from the Ottoman Empire, Safavid Persia, and North Africa. Again, um, Taruel does not romanticize it in any way, but um, a critical study of these figures, I think, is really, really important. Now, to me, the most interesting cases are indeed those where baptism itself, requested by non-Christians living beyond the bounds of our two empires, was what established connections. Don Juan, Prince of Candy, 
was one among perhaps a dozen Sri Lankan princes who chose to take baptism and thus join the Portuguese in their own quests for power. Contrary to Inca Garcilaso, who was born into an empire, these princes did not really have to do this. Others in Sri Lanka chose diplomacy with South Indian rulers or Muslim power networks, and they were not always ill succeeded. They just vanished from our record. Initially, such diplomatic attachment to the Portuguese crown did not even necessarily involve co conversion at all. Only from the 1540s onward did conversion become increasingly a standard ingredient in packages of vassalage. As in the North American borderlands, conversion was not mandatory for a ruler to become a vassal. That's how I understand it. But since it helped and seemed manageable, it was increasingly embraced by anyone approaching the Spanish authorities to, to propose a pact. Once such a relationship was established, it would typically be an ambiguous affair, offering an outlet for indigenous agency on the one hand, and a potential source for the gradual loss of autonomy on the other. The point again is that it was both at the same time. Happy beginnings often lead to unhappy endings. The embryo of unhappy endings is often present in the happiest of beginnings. There's something about the temporalities of attachment and how connectivity could foment conquest that needs pointing out here. In Sri Lanka, the transition took about nine decades, just right for a monograph, a little bit too much, and that's why no one reads it. In Sri Lanka, is that, that, that case was overlooked for, for a very long time. In the North American borderlands, the twists, the mergers, the migrations were so many over such an extended period and a, such an extended geographical area that a linear march towards indigenous annihilation really only emerges in the long durée. This is very much in contrast with the Caribbean, where the entire process of contact, diplomacy, conquest, and genocide came compressed into just a few years after 1492-94. Last but not least, some connections just never took off. So underneath the varying rhythms of attachment and detachment, connection and disconnection, diplomacy and conquest uh, or annihilation, one detects parallels between Asia, Africa and the Americas. I think it is fair to say that further comparative and connective studies into those potential patterns are now desirable. And the most widely prevalent gesture of emulation was conversion. Apart from the contentious possibility that conversion may have been believed to confer real and supernatural power, historians today are in agreement more widely about the power of performance. Performing a cultural attachment to a foreign authority, performing sameness can confer a lot of social capital and power. This can work along a number of lines. The act of raising a cross in a town plaza, for example, can serve, as Amy Bushnell puts it, as evidence of contract. The contractual nature of agreements with the Iberians is often acknowledged with hesitation by historians of the Iberian world who, myself included, worry about the unequal, the asymmetrical, unbalanced nature of what often looks more like medieval agreements of vassalage imposed, transplanted into other parts of the world. But contracts were negotiated diplomatically and could be read very differently on the two sides where Iberian sources tend to emphasize the subjection of indigenous rulers, a look behind the scenes often suggests that local agents emphasized voluntarism, reciprocity, neutrality. I see it as our obligation to perform a pendulum movement in this regard, testing the evidence for optimistic and less optimistic readings of these materials. It is also important not to lose sight of the antecedents that led to some agreements or things happening simultaneously elsewhere something we often don't do. The Guales of Florida, for example, came to terms with the Spanish in 1579 and again 1582 voluntarily, but this happened after some rather horrifying scorched earth campaigns. Returning to the performative nature of cross-cultural diplomacy then without romanticizing it, we can observe further patterns. The adoption of Christian names by local rulers usually came along with a wider adoption of cultural traits, such as body language, hairstyle, dress. Fray Andres de San Miguel reported from a visit to Cumberland Island near Jacksonville in 1595. I quote, this is again taken from uh, an article by Amy Bushnell. He, the chief and the chieftainess were Christians 
and spoke the Castilian language very well. He had a very good carriage and countenance of great strength. He was named Don Juan and dressed well in the Spanish manner. And when the chieftainess went out, she wore a cloak like a Spanish lady, end of quote. Not only does the wording echo that used by Portuguese commentators on Prince Don Juan de Cania, who was described, among other things, as having dark skin, but the countenance of a white person. It also surfaces in many other contexts, including ones where conversion was actually not involved, interestingly, because some societies were less prone than others to transitioning religiously. Alan Strathern has been working to theorize these differences. It's quite complicated. According to Sebastian Manrique, in 1640, the Sultan of Makassar in the island of Sulawesi, modern Indonesia, looked and behaved entirely like a Portuguese, despite being a Mahometan pagan. He would read letters in Portuguese without a translator, and his chancellor, Karain Patingalwan, was known for, coming, for owning a collection of Portuguese, Spanish, and Latin books, including the complete works of Fray Luis de Granada, of all things, a Spanish Dominican who spent much of his life in Portugal writing about prayer and meditation. Patin Galoang was said to speak fluent Portuguese and also be good at Spanish. And see, he seems to have enjoyed receiving Portuguese visitors, Portuguese books in hand, or asking questions about mathematics, astronomy, etc., etc. Another widely shared aspect was the requesting of Spanish or Portuguese individuals to serve locally under a king or other ruler. This tended to include religious figures, of course, perhaps at times to gain control over supernatural forces, it's not excluded, but also or mainly to obtain specialists capable of writing letters in the languages of these two empires. Friars could carry letters also and broker further agreements and requests were made abundantly across the North American borderlands for such figures in terms, again, very similar to those in Asia. Clearly, the two Iberian empires with their elaborate, complex communicational networks and their growing bureaucracies prompted similar um, actions in many different corners of the planet. To plug into those networks, specialists who could write and advise on diplomatic and religious matters were very valuable. This dynamic remained vigorous throughout the early modern period and into the 19th century in the correspondence of the kings of Daume, who famously entertained diplomatic relations with the Portuguese crown in the 1790s to 18 teens, in part to manage the trade in enslaved people from Africa to Brazil. In that correspondence, references to Portuguese mediators and scriveners abound. King Aglongo thus, thus asked in a letter dated from 1790, I quote, for white boys able to read and write. Last but not least, material culture. I have mentioned dress already. There were often extravagant requests for hats and coats and shirts and boots made of very fine materials. In the American borderlands in particular, the gifting of clothes was formalized and regulated and financed by the Spanish crown at considerable cost. Iberian style clothes and accessories gave power figures an immediately visible look, setting them apart from others locally. Elite extroversion, as sociologists call it, is usually on display for all to see. In fact, that is the whole point. And it is not enough to theorize this as compensation for local economic insufficiencies, people not being able to make those hats or something like that. Extroversion involved the carefully staged handling of foreign contacts, objects, and habits. Gifts might include beads or dogs and horses, books, clocks, collections of all of this and much more. Alas, one can still sense sometimes, at least in the scholarship, a vague sense that such appropriations pertaining to the world of mere appearances bordered on irrationality. Unless, of course, it was metal tools and firearms generally considered a more rational choice. This is sad in that historians of Europe have spent many decades exploring the very effective ways in which dress both reflected and produced power relations. Symbolic communication mattered in Europe. Why should it not matter in the same way elsewhere? There's an important factor subjacent to all of this, and I'm going to cut out this part here, which is that there's internal competition driving the attachment to the external. And that happens both in the peripheries, what 
may call the peripheries or not, and the centers. Um, it happens both in, you know, among the Navajo, in Cochin, in, in, in Congo, and in Lisbon. And I would like to learn more about what, what happens in this regard in Spain. But just as an example, the King of Portugal received a tiny bezoar stone, it's a Materia Medica, from the King of Cochin early on in the Portuguese-Cochin relationship. It was not really worth much, but it became a big thing at the court in, in Lisbon because it was the gift of the king, of a king, to the king, who was in the process of styling himself as standing above the rest of his court. So we have a, a process of stratification going on at the Portuguese court, probably something of the sort going on in Cochin where we have much less documentation. And the two kings mutually sort of whip themselves up to stand above uh, others by using extroversion, by using things from afar. Concluding then. As Spain's conquests in particular consolidated in the second half of the 16th century, it became, Spain became the head of a transcontinental composite monarchy, a conglomerate of realms from which existing rulers were removed, replaced by the monarch sitting in the middle of Spain. In the Hall of Realms, there was only room for one king. We call this an empire without further ado, yet I think it's also good to remember that it departed from a more widely shared understanding at the time of empire as something rather different. Empire as a body built on layered sovereignties, even layered suzerainties. Empire dependent on a combination of military might and constant diplomatic renegotiation with other kings. The kings that were cut out from the monarchy were still there around it. Uh, kings, caciques, chiefs, sultans, etc etc so this this logic this older logic of empire got punctured in the americas as the 16th century wore on the mexica empire became the vice royalty of new spain tawantinsu became the vice royalty of, of peru but the older what i would call the older and actually more widespread i think imperial logic of of diplomatically negotiating the subjection the submission of others of working out agreements of having these material exchanges of emulating the other selectively of proving to the other that one was worthy of trust by taking baptism for example all of this well, it didn't go away from one day to the next. It survived in much of Africa and Asia, as we know. And I would like to argue, and I would like to find more literature that, that supports this, because probably I suspect all these points have been made, but I'm not, I haven't found them really. I think it, it also survives in the so-called borderlands of North America. Those were the native ground, as Catherine Duval put it, or perhaps the contested ground. And there, the older notion that to have imperium is to manage relations with autonomous or semi-autonomous local leaders, well, it remained alive. That's what the whole thing was about in the so-called borderlands. And that is why a comparative and connective history of the native grounds in all three continents is, I think, needed. What then is the Iberian cosmopolis, the Catholic cosmopolis? I do not know, but it shines through our map now, traversing, carried by multiple agencies, central, peripheral, the peripheries being, of course, centers in their own rights, the various spaces of the Iberian world and its surroundings. It helps explain simple appropriations of symbols, as well as more elaborate integrations, all relating to, but not simply reacting to, the symbols of the imperial center. It is really difficult to find a good map of this thing, both the empire and the cosmopolis, of course. Um, and so I hope you forgive me for this really artless sketch, uh, which I really just put together today. I also hope it is clear that none of this justifies any sort of return to empire filia, imperiophilia. Global connections generated very substantial losses as well as gains. Historians with global interests are urged to take both aspects into account. Firmly placed in context, the cosmopolis, the cosmopolitan can, I think, help us engage with the complicated forces at play. <laughs>
these words may help us in some to access the combined European, African, Asian and American agencies that created the world we inhabit. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sultan. That was wonderful. And uh, there's so much there to think about, uh, I think, for future scholars, but also just for our Q&A today. Um, and so I will be looking for uh, questions that go up. There are no open questions at the moment in the Q&A. Um, but as we wait for that, one question that sort of comes to my mind to abuse my position here is, um, I was really struck by uh, your example of in-migration into some of these empires, into the Spanish or Portuguese empire. Uh, you know, uh, French uh, Protestants, for instance, going to the Spanish Low Countries, for instance. I think that's just a, a fascinating phenomenon. And I was wondering about the process of uh, people who might be religiously sort of marginal within the Iberian center, if we're going to use the language of center and periphery, moving to say the peripheral areas of the Iberian worlds, conversos and moriscos moving to the Americas, for instance. Um, and I was wondering if you could sort of talk about the margins of some of these empires, perhaps as spaces might allow for more of that, mm -hmm. um, uh, perhaps a, a, greater, a greater liberality or, or freedom of practice or conscience in some of those spaces. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's a very nice question to start with. I think a lot of this is really quite well known, right? Um, so the migration of conversos to the Americas, the whole uh, conundrum around being of the nación, nación, of being Portuguese, Jewish, New Christian, of um, traversing the Atlantic, going to settle in the River Plate region, coming to Cartagena um, and all these places and trying to somehow blend in, trying to claim uh, an identity that would allow um, people to to stay and to be part of this um, this new empire that they they were joining effectively, and then of course sometimes you know being uncovered. Um, to, to me, one of the most powerful uh, readings in this regard was many years ago was Nathan Vachtel's book, um, the the Faith of Remembrance. I think is the English translation La Foi du Souvenir, which which is really about this sort of being discovered in one's uh, wrong traditions and being uncovered and spied upon and 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 made into a Jew again. Um, I, the one one case that I, I think I mean obviously there are migrations of um, new Christians to Asia, uh, and um, that, 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 that I think that there's again quite a bit that can be read about this. It, it would, would go around the Cape, but there was also connections, of course, across the Middle East, which are really interesting. Um, Perhaps the one case I would sort of bring here for, to, to highlight to, to the audience because it's less known is that of, of West Africa. Uh, there's a wonderful book by Peter Mark and Jose Silva Orta. Oh, I can't remember the title, 2012, perhaps 10, um, about these um, conversos or Jews really who returned from, who had left Iberia for Amsterdam, for example, and then went to trade on the West African coast and established these little informal communities along the Petite Côte, which is in modern day Senegal, south of Dakar. Uh, and, and you just, I mean, who would expect there to be a synagogue there? I mean, obviously it's you know, a house used for prayers, but but uh, and objects and 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 interactions between and and a rediscovery of being Jewish somewhere in Africa, right? It's it's absolutely fascinating. And of course, these are reminders. I mean, all of these are reminders of the 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 massive outwards flow, the massive coercion, coercive forces at play. Um, you know, and the reasons why we should not romanticize any inward flows, of course. Um, thank you for a truly wonderful talk. I'm sure you know how interested I am in these matters. I'm going to hold off on my own questions to um, uh, just relay one that we have in the chat uh, from Chase Smith, who says, lovely to see you. Thank you for the fantastic talk. I was curious if you could speak more about the evidence for these material and visual aspects of performance between cultures. Uh, on balance, how important are one, surviving obje objects, such as clothing, bezer stones, etc. Two images, such as portraits, sketches, or drawings, and three, 
textual descriptions of this materiality. We can't hear you, Sultan, sorry. Just saying the obligatory but but sincere um, excellent questions. Um, three three excellent questions. Um, it's it's, it's uh, when we're talking about the 16th century, it's very very difficult to um, identify today surviving objects from a particular event, from a particular embassy, for example. Right? There are very very few objects that we can place in in a particular year, in a particular exchange. Um, for most of the objects, we, we just don't really know, despite the fact that there are many inventories, right? And uh, Anne-Marie Jordan and, and Kate Blow have worked on the, and many other people have worked on this, Nuno Senos, and uh, there's been projects around this. Um, so the material culture that survives in Portuguese and other collections is very rich, um, but often not attributable to any particular exchange. So we, we sort of rely on those objects to illustrate what we see in the, in the written record. Now the written record can be divided into parts, if you, if you wish, uh, manuscripts, inventories, letters, reports, mentions of this or that, that was seen at court or that was perhaps, perhaps taxed or that had to be distributed between various agents of the crown, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those the you know people find these. I just recently I got um, someone contacted me with a, a list of things that Don Juan de Castro, the viceroy in India, had had received. Um, that, that that's wonderful. But I I feel what's what's actually more fascinating even is what I mentioned with the Bezoar stone. So there's this little object that is really relatively worthless. It's the it's the equivalent of the famous beads that we always talk about. You know the beads that were given worthless beads. Um, that were taken for something important when they were not. Um, and that's not the point. The point is you get an object from far away and you, you handle it, you make it be seen, you explain that no one else can have this object, that you are special because you have this object. And then, in fact, the Bezoar stone appears in the Chronicles. And, and that, you know, in, in, Moreover, the chronicles, um, so I'm, this is it's a bit complicated because of course the chronicles, part of this was written a little later. So it's, it's, the, it's the dynasty styling and self-fashioning rather than just the king, but the manual the first. Um, but in Damien de Gaulle's chronicle of the um, very, of the most happy king uh, manual, um, you suddenly get these descriptions of, of gifts that were not really there in earlier chronicles. It starts with the, his predecessor, John II. But I think the, the talking and performing and writing about it, creating a record that is public is really, really important. Um, and of course, a lot of the stuff then gets, gets lost completely. Textiles, etc., will just decay. Um, images is something we don't really have a lot. So you, in, in European diplomacy, portraits take off in the late 15th, 16th century, right? Where you send uh, your little miniature portrait, for example, if you're, you're trying to, uh, to, to match, to, to make, to organize a, a marriage, a match. Um, so one would expect that sort of thing to happen at a longer distance, but it doesn't seem to be the case. I, I don't know. And also the dressing up in someone else's clothes, um, that is, of course, a very ambiguous thing, and we know more about that for like Elizabethan Ottoman relations, for example, right, where the Ottomans consider the handing over of a cloak of a, something that can be worn as a sign of superiority. Um, those kinds of transactions I don't see a lot, but there is a lot of hats and and cloaks, etc., going from Portugal to Asia and Africa. Um, Thank you. Um, I was going to ask you myself about something that um, I recall you spent some time on in the introduction to your book and that I think necessarily comes up um, any time that one contemplates, you know, these, these ambitious um, theorizing and comparative projects, right, which is this, this question of the scale, right, of the way in which we, we are always at some level uh, left with these micro histories, these stories of lives, right, as our as our basic um, evidence for uh, what is going on in this 
in this realm. And so towards the end, I thought you were just gesturing towards something more systemic, more to do with understanding the arrangements, the modes of interaction, you know, the diplomacy to call it that way. Um, but I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about that, that tension, right, between sort of following that, the, the stories of those incredible lives, um, and then the, the move you seemed to be recommending at the end of something more, of analyzing something more systematic or more widespread. That, that, that's a big question that, that um, has to do with the scale and with method and with narrative. Um, so I, partly I would just point to the um, past and present supplement 2019 on global microhistory uh, organized by John Paul Gabriel, uh, where I, I wrote something about um, this precisely this problem. Uh, now, the, the thing with global lives, with cosmopolitan lives and the, the sort of micro history approach through lives, it, it not, it's not necessarily micro history, but let, let's leave that aside. So that, that, was, that has been really, really important for the reconfiguration of our understanding of the early modern world, right? So connected history, of course, um, in significant measure has gone through retelling lives and uh, unearthing many of these lives. Um, that, that are absolutely fascinating. So, so in the early work of, mm. of Sanjay Subramaniam on this, in Serge Gouzaski's uh, Four Parts of the World, um, it's all built around this, this flow of people, of, of, of ideas going back and forth, etc. cetera. Um, I think there comes a point, and this is, it's, I think it's really important to say this is not a critique, but it's, there comes a point after 20 years of doing this, 25 years, where a certain anxiety, I think, you know, appears. What, what, what are we doing exactly? What are we by multiplying these narratives of global lives? What exactly are we achieving? So, uh, in one way, obviously, multiplying creates more and more evidence, and and quantity becomes quality. If you want, um, it 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 creates, you know, a network, a web that is global and decentered, and all of that, which which is great so I'm, I'm absolutely for but i think also that we need to think more about so that's what the question really is 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 pointing to about this articulation how you know how do we go from these little stories to the bigger picture and what what is it that we and i, I think part of what i'm trying to what i try to point out here today is the question of motivation and um the, the why, right? which is interestingly absent, for example, from Pollock's and Eaton's theorizing uh, about these sort of big cosmopoli. But I think with the aberrant materials, we can actually, there, there's enough, and prob probably also with the Persianate world, um, there is enough to, to find the motivation of these people. You know, why does a Navajo chief get into an agreement? Um, and if we put those motivations together, I think we start to see a picture that is a bit, in a way, grainier, but bigger, because these people are imagining space. They are talking, they are thinking about where they stand, how that in space relates to imperial power, right? the, the, the terrain, the buffer zone, the military, the, the and, um, and then I think also these objects that, that circulate and people that circulate do bring a, a conscientialization of the global realities at the time. So it's actually very, very quickly, the, the, you know, the various sultans of the Moluccas of the so-called Spice Islands early in the 16th century understood Portuguese-Spanish rivalry. Right? So there's a very sort of local stories of, I hate my brother, I want to be the, the sultan instead of the sultan. You know that sort of thing, um, but the step from there to understanding that are, there are two distant kings on the other side of the, the earth uh, that are competing, and that you can use that, it was very quick. Mm. Um, so it's that articulation. I would I would really like to to understand better, but I think we're sort of starting to understand how it works and and see the potential of 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 asking these slightly bigger questions again. Thank you. Um, we have another question in the Q&A. Um, this is from Mia Riedel. She says, uh, when you were discussing Lima, 
you said the city became less Spanish ethnically as the indigenous people became more Spanish through adopting Spanish dress and language. Mm -hmm. I think there's a difference between indigenous people assimilating to conquering empires and performing Iberian cultures. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, I guess that's that's at the heart of the question of how um, uh, mimicry or whatever we call it works. That the sort of the per performance of sameness. Um, are, are, you know, are we are we transforming the the other that we are emulating as we are doing this, or are we transforming ourselves? And I, I'm very aware that that my answer to this sounds a bit simple in the sense that it's sort of predictable, and it, but it it really is both. But but I think you know by reminding ourselves constantly of the sort of two way. Uh, flow of, of power um, that, that, you know, it, it doesn't mean that we go down into sort of considering everything negotiate to be negotiation, right? There is an imperial power, there's, an, there's, there's a conquest, there's a moment um, that is traumatic, that is a rupture. I, I do believe, I, I sort of tend to, to go with that side of the, of the interpretation of things. Um, and I don't think people forget that very easily, right? that there is a trauma and it's in the archeological record and it's hard to imagine it going away just, just because people are negotiating new identities, right? So there's pain, there's, there's, but there's also need and there's also opportunity. And, and you know, we, you, there's always a difference between first and second generation. Uh, sometimes it's, it, it gets inverted where the second generation becomes very conscious of what was lost um, and so on. So, but, but um, do I think there's a difference? Um, th there, there is necessarily, uh, but it's precisely in that difference that, that, um, that these, these sort of power structures or the flow of power becomes most, most visible, I think. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think. Might... Go ahead, Barbara. Oh, no, I was going to move into the next question. So if you were going to respond, Andrew, please go ahead. No, no, go right ahead. Uh, so we, we, we have a very, um, a very exciting and distinguished audience with us today. So this is from Karina Johnson. Um, thank you, Zoltan. Is there more that you would be interested in saying about the question of periodization in theorizing cosmopolitanism? Many of the examples you bring up and others I can think of that resonate with your categories occur in a first phase of relatively fluid politics and relatively fluid borders. You touched on this briefly. You're still muted, sorry. And I should mute myself. Hello, Karina, thank you very much. That, that's, it's great, great to, to, to have you here. And, and that, that's a big question, of course. And it's, it's one that I have really evaded. I'm usually very obsessed with, with uh, chronology. And um, uh, for today I thought that, you know, I'd throw things a little bit more into, you know, I throw the dice and, and uh, be generous um, to, to the audience. But, but of course that, that triggers this, this sort of um, question. Um, so I mean, on, on the one hand, there there are obviously things that seem to, you know, in fifteen hundred and something, eighteen hundred and something, you 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 still have similar requests, and and maybe the sort of request where you know people are asking for certain specialists, also military specialists, to come, that that you know maybe it's never really ceased, right? So what we have today, um, military um, specialists, Americans, etc., Russians, you know being moved around, requested by various uh, people in the world, that, that is still uh, you know, in continuity with that. Uh, and that's sort of quite sort of daunting um, to how, what, what do we do with this sort of thing that seems to be perennial, that, that doesn't seem to have a periodization at all. Um, part of what you're asking, I think, comes from the fact that, um, again, of these, the, the temporalities of, of the transition from contact to conquest. So in what we call Mexico, um, that sort of the alliances, the, the voluntary joining or semi-voluntary joining or the, the styling of participation um, as in indigenous conquistadors, etc., that sort of thing occurs in a sort of early time frame, 1520s, 30s, people going to Madrid, negotiating their coats of arms. Um, you know, claiming I'm the son of Moctezuma II, and um, he participated in the conquest, therefore I am this and that, I'm, I'm entitled to this and that, etc., etc. Um, 
and that sort of relates well with stories in Asia that happen over a much longer period of time. Um, so in that sense, you know, between New Spain, Peru, and the rest, there is there is a difference. There's a profound difference. But I think that that's why I'm trying to sort of push push the argument a little bit to the to the edges where. Um, similar I'm, i sort of struggle because I, you know i don't like to say this an older model and not newer model etc but but there seems to be long, a longer continuity of that sort of thing happening because quite simply because those areas fall outside of the realm of what was in the, the monarchy in 1573 so it's 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 out there and it's different and um it's going to take longer and then of course north america becomes a borderland also because other Europeans appear and compete, right? so that that then messes it up, and that again is actually uh, comparable to what happens in Asia after 1600 when the Dutch appear and the English, and later the French. So uh, there's so many possible connections also around periodization that that uh, I, I haven't really found any any framework, any anything about this. Um, I'd, I'd be really grateful. I mean, genuinely grateful if people could point me to readings that I've missed, but there's such a huge amount written on the Americas. I, I can actually, just to follow up on Karina's um, question, let me see if I can, there's no question right now, right? So can, I can um, show you this for a moment. Do you see my PowerPoint again? Yeah. Um, so uh, I sort of integrated tiny miniatures of this in my, in my map, let me see if I can, mm -hmm. the, um, which I, I, I think <laughs> this is very tentative. This is sort of me being quite cocky about materials I really don't know very much about, right? But they're, they're sort of different ways of, of engaging and emulating and, and, and bringing in the imperial into your own world. So there, of course, we have, you know, coat of arms at El Escorial on the facade, um, the, the real thing, the official thing. Or I could have brought Charles V's um, uh, coat of arms, of course. Uh, now, now, here we have an indigenous leader. And by the way, I'm using indigenous encouraged by the way it's used in, in Americanist scholarship. Um, I, I don't think anyone uses it for, for Asia anymore. Uh, but here you have someone, you know, in, fully still fully grounded in their own culture, military culture, etc., um, who has taken the Spanish, the symbol of Spanish authority, and put it, you know, on display and just added it, appropriated it in addition to other things. Uh, there's also a sword, of course, um, but you know, there's also the, the, the jaguar. So. And this is a later representation, 17th century, but it refers to the early period, to the conquest period. Um, and then you have these, so that's the sort of something I came across by accident. I'm not sure if, if this mm -hmm. it's been theorized at all, um, but I feel that's often sort of the first step, right? Um, like when you're, you, you know, when I was a teenager and, you know, having a ghetto blaster was sort of the first step in becoming part of that larger American world that that was then you know what what the, the thing um, the second stage here is where you actually you are integrated you are already you have been conquered um, you're in the realm you are trying to salvage what you can and you go and petition um, in Madrid to obtain some sort of sign that you are you know both a subject of the empire and still powerful on grounds of your old status, prestige, etc. cetera. Um, so, you know, there are different stages. And then once you start discussing the, what goes on inside these escutcheons, it, it, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a rabbit hole around mm. you know, hybridity, et cetera, and it's discontent. So, so I don't want to go there now. It's interesting. I was just thinking about the first image. I know they've gone away, but... Um, and I don't know anything about the text that accompanies it or what moment it's meant to be depicting, but um, that particular image seemed to me very unstable around um, the, the items as spoils, 
which is another incorporation, right? But a less um, accommodating one, if you will, right? And 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 I think that's interesting too, right? That the the taking of the objects of the other can sometimes be a little um, less about emulation and more and more combative. That's a very good point. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, the perhaps perhaps the sort of most spectacular thing that happens in that area is is something that you know, most Iberianists are not aware of, of at all, which is um, it's it's the cultural and political movement Sarmatism in Poland, in early modern Poland, right, where the the Polish nobility um, through spoils of war dresses like Turks and fashions itself, you know, Poles of all people, you know, most Catholic Poles, but dressing as Turks. Um, uh, and, and of course, the, it, it's all, I mean, it, it, I don't think there is a comparative study of that and Moros mm -hmm. y Cristianos in Spain, but it would be so fascinating to, to, to compare those things um, because it's, it's, there's obviously a, a greater geographical distance between the Poles and the Ottomans. Um, but there's there's so much subtlety and complication in doing this. How do you do this without coming across, uh, you know, as the mm -hmm. wrong kind of Christian? Um, I think for, for Asia, it's again, it's very, there's of course a difference in the sort of prestige attached to Islamic, Islamic, so, Eaton critiques, of course, the notion of an Islamic uh, material culture, aesthetic culture. So, you know, Moorish objects uh, that have a, a fairly high status and are still in the early 16th century, obviously very familiar to anyone coming from Spain, right? So, so I mean, in anyone coming from Spain or Portugal in the early 1500s to a place like Hormuz, for example, you know, sitting on cushions on the floor is, it's, it's not that, exceptionally different right so mm -hmm. between imitation and really just sort of slipping into it quite easily um, there's there's a thin line and then in the 1530s 40s you see the Portuguese nobility suddenly reacting Don Juan de Castro for example assuming a more classicist uh, a more that what we would see as western as opposed to oriental um, fashion etc cetera, etc cetera. and then it's it's more complicated than that but i'm not gonna uh, mm. that's fascinating that. in terms of the how um the the metropolitan dynamics are in fact impacting what we tend to naturalize as the obvious way in which mm -hmm. people will interact in in the um imperial spaces but which in fact is is very susceptible to a particular mode of engagement that that has to do with what is going on in the in the metropolitan space? That's really mm -hmm. interesting. That's really interesting. Um, we have time for maybe two more quick questions. Um, we have one from John Rogers, who asks, "Do you think there is much that can be learned about the 16th and 17th century Catholic cosmopolis from its afterlife in Asia, for instance, mm -hmm. in areas that came under Dutch and British power?" As you know, a Portuguese mm -hmm. Creole was still quite prevalent in some Indian Ocean port cities and towns until the late 19th century. Um, yeah, I mean, was there a, a Latin Asia, right? Was there as a Latin America, which is obviously a later sort of French invention, if you want, but uh, was there, a, a, and, and what does it tell us? Um, so, I mean, people in Portugal in the 16th century and in the, the, the empire in Asia were quite aware that, that the language and the cultural impact might actually be the ones that would last. Um, interesting. So Jean de Barge actually talks about this, right? Once, even when the empire, when the empire will be gone, these things will remain. And he was right; it's still there, right? Um, now, there's obviously a, a big difference between the way um, the Portuguese public today perceives this, as you know, there's you know, still Portuguese people in Asia, and the way it has become really tiny, right? Um, so I'm, I'm sort of talking against myself here, but but the, the truth is, and that's I think what John uh, is is pointing um, at, is that um, even on, even in areas where the Portuguese were ousted militarily, um, so in Sri Lanka, for example, um, um, 
Portuguese remained the, the language. And the, the, there's a, one of the Dutch governors in 1660s maybe complains, oh, we're getting these slaves in from Arakan and they don't learn Dutch, they learn Portuguese because it's easier. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And the Dutch themselves were actually partly probably responsible for this because they knew some Spanish. Uh, you can see in, in a lot of the early sort of transactions between the Dutch and the Portuguese in Asia that the, the Dutch are writing in Spanish. Because uh, that's, that's what they, you know, that, that was the enemy at home and so they knew the language. Um, does this reinforce the notion that there's a cosmopolis? I, th I, I, I don't know, I mean, I, I still don't even know if there is a cosmopolis, but there certainly is a sign here of the sort of the the profound, the rooting of, so it's not just superficial, you know, adopting, or it, it could be in the first generation, you know, we'll just take baptism because, you know, uh, instrumentally it's, it's, it favors us, but it does create Christian populations, right? It does create uh, um, people speaking the language, people dressing as Portuguese, um, people, you know, still, I think still today, there's a king in Larantuka in, in, in um, Eastern Indonesia who, who you know, who dons a, a, an Iberian helmet and, um, and, and, you know, styles himself as a descendant of people who were in diplomatic contact with Spain and Portugal. Um, and a question from the Pedro Cardin um, mm -hmm. says, regarding cosmopolitanism, do you think there is anything specific to the Iberian monarchies when compared with the other European colonial powers and the Catholic component, did that play a role? Yeah, so so obviously the Catholic component, I, I mean, I think it, it clearly played a role. What I don't really uh, know how to, because I'm really not a religious historian, is how, uh, you know, Catholic universalism can be made to fit with the cosmopolis um, because that's, there, there is a tension there that, that's very, very strong, right? Um, the, 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 the door into it, obviously, is that um, once you become a Christian, in theory, you are like anyone else, but that, of course, in practice, never, never quite uh, functions. Now, um, is there a difference between Iberian and uh, the others? The obvious danger in as answering this question is reification is the sort of that, you know, we, we, one of the things that I really have tried to get away from is this sort of contrast between the, Port the Portuguese and the Dutch in Asia, right? The rational, cold, unreligi religiously uninterested Dutch. And obviously there's some truth to that myth. There is some of that. Um, but, but it doesn't explain everything. I, th I think a much more interesting explanation actually, but it's not some, you know, I, I sort of, I actually wrote this some many years ago and I, I hadn't really thought about it, um, is, is, is actually again, chronology, obviously a, a power that expands from Europe in the early 15, in the late 1400s, huh? it's gonna be different than a power expanding in 1602. It's, it's got to be different, right? There has to be, and whether we call it modernity or, and, or not, we like it or not, um, but there are certain changes. And, and of course, a company that is there to make profit is going to behave differently. The, the, the really fascinating thing to me, and with this, I, that's, that's, I think that would be my main reply to this, is again, the, the power of the non-European. So Sri Lanka, ex excuse me for coming back to this, but the process that the Portuguese underwent of being attracted to Sri Lanka, of being dragged into local wars and then becoming conquerors, that's what my book is all about. Actually, the Dutch went through the same. They did not want to be conquerors and they became conquerors. And the British sort of went through the same around 1800. So you, you, you have to ask the question, you know, why is this happening there to three successive European powers? in such a repetitive way, right? It, th there has to be something about the way we have not written the stories of these European empires with sufficient input from the so-called peripheries. And that, that, and that really, I think, breaks down the barriers often between Portuguese, uh, Dutch and English imperialism expansion. For the Spanish case, I'm much less comfortable saying this, but I suspect that, you know, with the right angle, the, the right sort of 
uh, lens on this, we, we, we might be able to tease out some quite similar things, perhaps, perhaps not. Well, thank you so much. I think that takes us up through the end of our Q&A session here. Uh, but what a stimulating, wonderful talk. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. I know it's uh, 9.30 in the evening where you are, yes. if I have that correct. Um, so um, mm -hmm. thank you for staying up and enlightening us. Uh, and thanks to everybody in the audience for uh, joining us on Zoom today. Uh, we are hoping that next year we will be able to resume in person. Uh, so fingers crossed on that. Ojalá. Thank you so much to everyone.